introduction, and folks, we'll see how this goes. Doug can uh, vouch for this. I'm a, a wanderer. Um, I like to walk around, so we'll see how it goes with me trying to stand on this podium today. I've been told not to step off of this podium. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say appreciate the opportunity from Bear Crop Science to come and to uh, speak with you about some of the issues that we're dealing with uh, within the Mid-South as well as the uh, U.S. as a whole in terms of resistance. And I really think that there are some practices, there's some concepts that I'm going to share with you today that you can apply to your uh, Canadian agriculture. One thing is for certain for us, in 1996, or prior to 1996, we had some major issues that we were dealing with in the U.S. from a resistance standpoint, and especially in the southern U.S. region, and that was ALS resistance. And as a result of that, in 1996, when Roundup Ready soybeans were launched, our growers quickly, quickly adopted that technology, much more so than the growers in the Midwestern U.S. In 1997, Roundup Ready cotton was launched. What did we do? We adopted Roundup Ready cotton. 1998, Roundup Ready corn was launched. We adopted Roundup Ready corn. Folks, I will tell you today, again, we quickly adopted those those three crops, those, that, that trait, that single trait. And I will also tell you that it was common for our growers to plant Roundup Ready soybeans, found up, followed by Roundup Ready corn, followed by Roundup Ready cotton. And that in itself is not a rotation. And as a result of that, we're confronted with some major issues today throughout, not only the Mid-South, but the U.S. as a whole. And I'm going to share some of that with you. One thing is for certain, in 1996, when we adopted this technology, it was an excellent technology. And I can remember the days. I remember the days in the late 90s when Monsanto told us, and I'm sure they told some of you, don't put anything in the tank other than Roundup. Roundup is the cure-all from a weed standpoint. And it was great. I will say this. It was great, and a lot of our fields looked like this. This is a cotton field that was, a photo was taken in the early 2000s. We could not find a weed in the field. I remember in the early 2000s, I said to myself at, uh, sometimes, I said, is there even a need today for a weed scientist? Because you make an application of Roundup, one application, two applications. At the end of the growing season, folks, there were absolutely no weeds in these fields. And life was good. 2001, the first glyphosate-resistant weed was found globally. And that was found in the U.S. in Delaware. In 2003, we had the luxury of also finding this great weed. It didn't have a major impact for us. Uh, Dr. Harker has spoken about this today. Glyphosate-resistant horseweed, you guys, again, would call it fleabane. Here is an application, two applications of glyphosate or Roundup had been made to this field. The grower was actually intending to plant cotton in this field, and you can imagine, obviously, uh, there's some hurdles to overcome prior to planting that cotton crop. But I will say this. We either place 2,4-D in the tank or we place dicamba, depending on where you're located in the U.S. and, US and depending on what your cropping systems are, and that quickly solved our fleabane horseweed problem. But with that being said, we quickly had another problem, and this is the weed this is the weed that has, I believe, placed the U.S. On, a, on the map from the standpoint of glyphosate resistance. I'm going to talk with you again today about some of our experience with dealing with resistance and then how it has changed our production practices and what we're doing to actually deal with uh, these, this weed, as well as some other weeds. I want to tell you a little story about this field here that I'm using as a, as a background uh, for this slide. This field in 2007... I was in the field, this is Roundup Ready Cotton, and it was sprayed three times with Roundup. There was Palmer Amaranth in the field, but there wasn't any there at harvest. We did an excellent job of controlling it. 2008, we planted Roundup Ready Cotton in the field. No Palmer Amaranth, no pigweed, and folks, if I say pigweed today, I'm referring to it as Palmer Amaranth. There was no Palmer Amaranth in the field at harvest. 2009, we sprayed this field. At the end of the growing season, there were three Palmer amaranth in the field. Who cares? There were only three. 
I remember walking the field. The next year, we had a problem. This photo was taken the following year. There was Roundup Ready cotton planted in this field, and folks, you can see the level of control of that glyphosate-resistant Palmer amaranth. Three plants to here's where we were within a matter of a couple of years. Complete loss, complete loss of the world's greatest herbicide. When I talk about glyphosate today, it's, it's interesting. For the most part, it is lost in much of our geography, especially on this weed. And I had a good friend, Steve Powell, from Australia. And Steve equates the loss of glyphosate to that of penicillin. And I think he's right. Glyphosate is, well, it is. It's a once-in-a-lifetime discovery. I am confident that Bear Crop Science, Monsanto, there will be no discovery from a herbicide standpoint that's going to rival the impact that glyphosate has had on production agriculture from a world's perspective. And it's unfortunate for us that this herbicide is lost on several weeds over vast geographies within the U.S. As I travel around the U.S. and I, I speak on the topic of herbicide resistance, there's some reoccurring thoughts that are being, being put forth, and I want to share some of this with you today, and I think it really la lays the groundwork for the presentation that I'm going to make. There's a thought that's being put forth that says, herbicides alone can solve my weed problem. I just need another herbicide mode of action that's effective. That's the treadmill that Dr. Harker mentioned this morning. Folks, we're on a treadmill, and that is we use one mode of action, we move to the next, we move to the next, we move to the next, and as Stephen pointed out this morning, the problem is there isn't anything at the end of the road from the standpoint of a new mode of action at this point. We're quickly going through these modes of action with nothing to supplement this resistance that we're being confronted with. Fact or fiction, and I ask you this, fact or fiction, is this a true statement? Two modes of action is an effective resistance management program. And folks, one thing is I'm going to expect a little interaction here. Is, is that a true statement, yes or no? Two modes of action in one application. And the reason also I, I place this up here, a lot, of companies, a lot of companies would mention two modes of action is an effective resistance management program. I've, I've heard that mentioned. That's the question, and, and the question is, are both modes of action effective on the weeds that we're targeting? And we're actually going to talk more about that today. I will contend that you taking an ACCA's herbicide and you mixing it with an auxin herbicide and someone promoting that as multiple modes of action, that's not an effective strategy for managing resistance. And we're going to talk some um, about that in the remainder of the presentation. Once I have a resistant re weed, I can get rid of it and effectively use that herbicide again. Folks, I will tell you that is not a true statement, and I'm going to give you some evidence today as to why once you lose control of a weed with a herbicide, you're not going to be able to effectively use that herbicide again on that weed. Allowing a few weeds to escape control is okay. I can assure you that for resistant prone weeds, that being kochia, that being palmer amaranth, that being wild oat, if we're allowing a few to escape control, as I was showing you earlier, with those three plants that escape control. That's not okay. Economic thresholds, we're going to talk about that today. Economic thresholds, folks, do not apply when I'm dealing with a resistant prone weed. I only need to identify or I only need to manage those weeds that are in the field. Who cares about the weeds on the roadside? Who cares about the weeds in the turn row on the edge of the field? I can assure you those weeds can and will contribute to resistance. And here's one, being in Canada today, that weed will not grow here. It's too cold. This is a, con I'll, I'll be honest with you, this is a common statement that my Midwestern friends would make two years ago, three years ago. They don't make this statement today. Why do they not make this statement today? Because they're dealing with the same issue, even the same weed that we're dealing with at times in the Mid-South. And I'm gonna, again, we're gonna discuss that further uh, today. One thing is for certain, the six points I just shared with you, these are all fallacies regarding resistance management. 
Now I'm going to use the remainder of the presentation. We're going to talk about Palmer Amaranth as kind of my model weed. But again, I really think the concepts that we share with you today, you can take and apply to Canadian agriculture. And first of all, I'm going to talk about the impact that this weed has had on U.S. agriculture. And I want to start by just showing you this little weed here, the little wimpy weed. That weed, I want you, most of you, if you have a pen, if you take a look at the end of that pen, the seed size is actually, pro it's actually probably a little smaller than the end of your pen. Very, very small seed. The plant emerges. Over the first seven days, it's going to grow about two inches. Nothing of significance. But after it reaches about two inches under good growing conditions, warm growing conditions, um, it's going to grow at a rate of about two to two and a half inches per day. Folks, in a week's time, it can grow 12 to 14 inches. That makes control quite challenging if we miss that first herbicide application. Let's look at the U.S. map here. If you take a look at this weed, it actually evolved out of a warm, desert-like climate. And then when we look at the 1980s and we even look at the 90s, this weed was found throughout much of the southern U.S. I would tell you this, it, it wasn't the number one weed in the southern U.S. I'm not for sure. Actually, most states, I would tell you, it wouldn't even be considered one of the top ten weeds in most of these states. But this is where it existed. In 2005, Stanley Culpepper at the University of Georgia, he had the privilege of finding the first glyphosate-resistant Palmer amaranth. And things changed drastically from there. In 2006, we found it in northeast Arkansas. It was also found in western Tennessee. But again, the weeds limited to the southern U.S. A few years later, a colleague of mine in Michigan found glyphosate-resistant Palmer amaranth. Well, hold on here, folks. I thought I just told you this weed exists in the southern U.S. So now here we are, we're finding it in Michigan. How and why did we find this weed in Michigan? The reason it was found in Michigan was they were actually purchasing, they were actually purchasing feedstock from the southern U.S. They were actually cotton seed hulls is what it's believed. They were purchasing out of the southern U.S. and they were feeding those to dairy cattle. Guess what was in the cotton seed hulls? Glyphosate resistant Palmer amaranth. Today, I saw a presentation here, it's been a few weeks, maybe a couple of months ago now. Dr. Spray gave a presentation at the American Soybean Association where I also spoke. And there she was saying that now there are 11 counties within Michigan and this weed continues its march up northward in Michigan. Cold weather does not seem to be a barrier, at least at this point. Also, this is, is quite interesting. If you take a look at your slides, I was asked to send, you, uh, send my slides, turn them in a week in advance. And I hate turning slides in a week in advance, but I, I cooperated. What's interesting is when I travel and I, I speak on the topic of herbicide resistance, it seems like I'm always updating this map. When I actually sent in these slides, there were 25 states in the U.S. that had confirmed glyphosate resistance. I was talking with my colleague Mark Liu from Ohio State. I was talking with him last Friday, and Mark informed me that the state of Ohio now has glyphosate-resistant Palmer amaranth. Folks, look at all of these states that historically have not even had Palmer amaranth. Illinois, or Indiana, Illinois, Ohio. All of this region up through here now has glyphosate-resistant Palmer amaranth. California, out west. It's moving, and it's moving westward, and it's moving northward, and I'm going to make a bold prediction here today. I'm going to make a prediction that it's within the next two years, the southern region of Canada here will have, will have glyphosate-resistant Palmer amaranth. Now I want to share a little bit about the impact of this weed. So we're at 26 states, and I always use the term and counting. So what's been the impact of Palmer amaranth on southern agriculture? 
Another thing that I actually changed for this presentation is, after looking at this, it was quite obvious to me, giving it more thought, I think at this point I can cross out the word southern agriculture because Palmer amaranth in itself is beginning to have an impact on U.S. agriculture. So what has it done? Palmer amaranth, where we have it within these fields, whether it be cotton, whether it be soybean, it has increased the complexity tremendously in terms of management. It's increased the cost by two to three fold in many of these fields. And that's generally, I'll say this, this isn't something that's specific to Palmer. Resistance in a whole, as a whole is going to increase the complexity and the cost of weed management. It's reduced the harvest efficiency. That's not surprising. We've had complete crop loss. Now, this would be surprising probably to many, but complete crop loss, and we've even abandoned fields. I'll show you some photographs uh, here in the next few slides. We've had complete loss of the family farm. I'm going to share a story with you here in a few, in a few minutes, and the story I'm going to share you is, is not unique. I mean, there's other individuals throughout the Mid-South, throughout Arkansas, that's experienced the same uh, result of resistance. It's compromised conservation tillage. Uh, the state of Tennessee, which is right adjacent to Arkansas, has been a large proponent, has been very instrumental in conservation tillage across the U.S., no-till. And if we look back six years ago, ten years ago, what we would see is 90-95% of Tennessee agriculture would have been no-till. We actually did some survey work across the Mid-South, and Tennessee took part in this here. Um, it's been about a year ago now. And what we found was less than 50% of Tennessee today is using no-till. Why is that? Because of resistance. It's perpetuating resistance to other herbicides. And you say, other broadleaf herbicides. And you say, how can that be the case? I'm going to show you in this presentation how resistance evolves to these other herbicides as a result of glyphosate resistance. What's interesting is, Stephen, in his presentation earlier today, he was talking about water hemp. You saw what he was mentioning from Pat Trannell's work there in Illinois. ALS resistance. They had ALS resistance. Glyphosate came along. Now they have glyphosate resistance. And what has been propping up both ALS resistance and glyphosate resistance in this system has been the PPO herbicides for them. What are they losing today? They're losing the PPO herbicides, absolutely. And it, it, it's quite unfortunate. Now here's a very bold statement. A very bold statement, but I I'm, I'm feel comfortable making it. And that is today, on many farms across the Mid-South, glyphosate has become a grass herbicide. And also, I will say this, we have farms in Arkansas where we have grass resistance as well as broadleaf resistance where essentially glyphosate is an adjuvant. Glyphosate does control some weeds on that farm, but at the end of the day, because of the fact that we have a grass weed and we have a broadleaf weed, we are really having to have extremely complex systems to manage these herbicide-resistant weeds. Now, I want to share this with you. I was driving down the road. I'd come from a farm on July the 24th. I'd been visiting with a grower, and I was driving down the road, and I had a text that was sent to me. And the text was actually from a farmer there in Arkansas. And this was his perspective on pigweed. And it really illustrates, it drives home the points that I've made uh, so far in this presentation. I want to read this to you. It says, I'm on the interstate in an area where there are no crops for miles. The side of the road is covered in pigweed, a.k.a. Palmer amaranth. We are fighting a weed whose reproductive capabilities rival the spending habits of Congress. Okay. The ability to transport itself is like an airborne disease. I think despite feeling like we know what we're up against, we really do not know what we are fighting. In the future, we will hear of a farmer retiring, not due to cost, age, health, or desire. He will merely say that I am tired of fighting this blankety-blank weed. We hear of people turning farms away because of pigweed. In the past, we wanted to know the soil type. We wanted to know the payments. But today, we want to know the weed pressure. Folks, that summarizes where we are, where we are in the southern U.S. and even regions 
of the Midwestern U.S. at this point. And it's very unfortunate. Here are the photos. Folks, that's a production field. That is a soybean production field that has had glyphosate over the top of it and obviously, as you can see, complete crop loss. Here's another soybean field. There's a soybean field. I took this photo. It was interesting. The individual actually abandoned portions of the crop. He actually destroyed it, and then he left other regions within this field that he could actually harvest. I will tell you today, he actually probably caused himself more harm leaving this than he did himself good. And we'll talk about the soil seed bank. There's a cotton crop. I can assure you cotton is a very expensive crop to grow. Back three years ago, two to three years ago now, we had in excess of a million acres of cotton in the state of Arkansas. In 2013, we had 275,000 acres. Now, there's two reasons for that. One is price. Price has come down, and as a result, we've shifted some acres, shifted some acres over to corn. But I can assure you also, this weed right here has been a major driver in uh, shift away from some of our cotton acres. There's corn. A lot of people think that corn, well, corn should be immune to these resistance issues. When I look at the state of Arkansas, we grow cotton, corn, soybean, Roundup Ready, those crops are going to all contain glyphosate-resistant Palmer amaranth. Actually, Palmer amaranth is probably, well, it is. It's the number one weed in each of those crops. Rice. We grow about half of the U.S. rice. Folks, rice is flooded. Back three years ago, four years ago, Palmer amaranth began, began to be an issue in rice. Today, Palmer amaranth is the third most problematic weed in rice in the state of Arkansas based on a recent survey. The only weed that we have, or the only crop that we grow in the state where Palmer amaranth is not a major issue for us is wheat. Well, why is it wheat? The reason that Palmer amaranth is not a major issue in our wheat crop is we plant wheat late October, early November. Palmer amaranth ceases emergence about that time. And then our wheat crop is going to, well, we're going to canopy by late March, early April. Palmer doesn't start emerging until early April. Hence, we don't have an issue with Palmer amaranth in our wheat crop. We're going to harvest our wheat crop the first week of June. Once we harvest that wheat crop, we'll then plant a crop of soybean. Here's a field that I had an opportunity to go out and visit in 2008. And this is a weed that you do not have here in Canada, but you have a weed that would kind of resemble this, and it would be quackgrass. This is a perennial weed. It's going to be about six feet tall at maturity. And I'm out collecting uh, seed heads that we screen and eventually, again, prove to be glyphosate resistant. And actually, I'm not in the worst part of this field. If you look back here behind me, there's regions of this field, areas of this field where we completely lost the crop as a result of glyphosate resistance. I want to tell you a little bit about this field. This grower had some major issues with resistance back in the mid-90s. And he actually rapidly adopted the Roundup Ready technology. And he used low rates of Roundup. And those low rates were what he considered to be effective. Roundup was still expensive at that time. After a short period of time, the Roundup was no longer effective at those low rates. So what did he do? He slightly increased his rate until he found a rate that was effective. And he did that for several years until eventually he got to the point where a 1x rate of glyphosate or Roundup was no longer effective. And at that point then we were called out, myself and a colleague of mine was called out to take a look at this field and confirm glyphosate resistance. But what was interesting also is we found out when we started screening and we look at this, you, you take a look, this is a grass. What's the, what's the common solution to killing a grass? Spray what mode of action on it? A group one, ACCA's herbicide, very, very effective in controlling this, you would expect. But what was interesting is actually this individual had some failures. Prior to Roundup Ready, he had some failures of the group one chemistry in this field. 
but this field had been clean for some time. Actually, when we came in and we tested this, we found that we had FOP resistance, group 1 ACCA FOP resistance, as well as glyphosate resistance. But while I was on this farm, I also noticed that he had another major issue. This individual was actually growing 8,000 acres of soybeans. And he had regions of this farm, areas on this farm, where basically he was going to lose the crop as a result of glyphosate resistance. And I will tell you, we went back in and we leased, we actually leased this portion of the farm, three acres, uh, we had a lease uh, where we worked out a deal with him where essentially we could go in and spray and evaluate uh, various herbicide programs, various strategies in terms of managing this. And I kept an eye on the rest of his farm. That fall, I gave him a call and said, hey, I would like to come back the next year and we would like to do some additional work with Johnson grass. He indicated at that time he had lost 2,000 acres of that farm. I said, why did you lose 2,000 acres? And he said, because of low yields. Low yields, essentially, that resulted from this weed right here, and that being glyphosate-resistant Palmer amaranth. I think if I recall correctly, he yielded 10 bushel per acre that year across the farm when the county average, the regional average there, was somewhere between 50 and 60 bushel. And that's all a result of glyphosate resistance. The next year, he planted Roundup Ready soybeans. He sprayed the farm with glyphosate. Did absolutely nothing different. Folks, did you think he had it? What was the result? Was it any different? No, it wasn't any different. He got the same exact result. I called him in the fall of the year and said, I want to come back and we, we would like to do some more work with Johnson grass. He said, I'm sorry. He said, you need to contact, and he gave me the name of the farmer. He said, I no longer have the farm. He lost the farm. I will tell you this, I have been on that farm every year since. The individual that's been on that farm for the last three years now has done a fabulous job in terms of raising a soybean crop, and this past year raising even a cotton crop. And he's actually used the strategies that we're going to talk about in the remainder of the presentation. He rotated traits. He's been growing Liberty Link uh, soybeans. He's been using pre-emergence herbicides on that farm. He's been doing some drill seeding to close uh, rapid canopy formations, some concepts that, again, aren't foreign to any of us in this room. How did we get into this situation? We planted nothing but Roundup Ready crop. We sprayed them with nothing but Roundup. We applied our Roundup, I'm not going to say on all the acres, but on some of our acres we applied the Roundup at reduced rates to save money. We made applications to weeds that were too large. I can remember Roundup was so effective, and obviously you guys know it has absolutely no residual activity. In our systems, we generally grow a 38-inch row, 38-inch soybean, 38-inch corn, 38-inch cotton. It may take those soybeans as many as... 10 weeks to canopy. Cotton is going to take around 10 weeks, maybe 12 weeks to canopy. So what happens in an open canopy crop? We just keep coming and coming and coming. So what did our growers do? Rather than making that application in a timely manner, they actually waited until they had larger weeds and we would make one application, two applications, maybe three applications, depending upon the crop, to try to control these weeds. And I can assure you today that has contributed to the resistance that we have. One thing is for certain, when I look across the U.S., and this is not restricted to the southern U.S., when I look across the U.S. in general, our weed control programs lack diversity. They lack diversity, and as a result of that, we have resistance. Now, I want to bring something a little bit closer home to you. Being here in Canada today uh, speaking with you, I want to talk a little bit about kochia here for just a second. Here is the map of kochia, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We have seven states now that have glyphosate-resistant kochia, and I believe, if I'm correct, what, 2011, 2012, you guys now have glyphosate-resistant kochia. This is a weed that is really beginning to have a major impact on the prairie region of the U.S. in terms of soybean production as well as uh, some of our other crops. What's interesting is if you take a look in the U.S., you take a look at the resistance to kochia, 
we now have group two resistance, group four resistance, group five resistance, and group nine. I'm going to tell you today, we do not have a population that I'm aware of that has resistance to all four of these. But last time I checked, kosha is a highly, it has high, high percentage of outcrossing within that species. And as a result of that, it is going to be a very short period, I'm confident, it will be a very short period before we will see resistance to at least four modes of action within kosher. It just makes sense to me as I take a look at this. Uh, water hemp. Here's another weed you see where it exists within the U.S., at least glyphosate resistant water hemp. Do we have it in Arkansas? Yes, we probably do. The problem is pretty much all of our fields at this point are infested with glyphosate resistant Palmer amaranth. This is not a major weed for us. It is a major weed here in most of the northern U.S. Stephen pointed this out in his presentation. Group 2, Group 5, Group 9, Group 14, Group 27. My understanding now, there are populations in the state of Illinois, if I'm correct, I heard Aaron Hager say this here uh, a month or two ago now, that have resistance, I believe, to four of these five modes of action. A single population with resistance to four or five modes of action. I can assure you, when we start getting to the point where we have a field with resistance to four, five, six modes of action, folks, it becomes extremely, extremely challenging to control these resistant weeds at that point. Now here's a group out of Canada, the Stratus Agri Marketing uh, Group. You may be familiar with them. They actually conducted a survey in the U.S. back in 2012, and it's, it's pretty striking as to what they found. If you look on the y-axis, these are infested acres and millions of, of, of acres with glyphosate resistance. And basically to summarize what they found was by 2012, or in 2012, 50%, 50% of the U.S. acres were infested with glyphosate resistance. What was also interesting is that you see this, this increase here. When did we find our first glyphosate resistant weed? I started the presentation off by mentioning that. When was the first glyphosate resistant weed found? 2001. 2001 found the first glyphosate resistant weed in Delaware. So let's go back and say in 2001 you can essentially put this at zero or a few hundred acres. And if you do that and you actually extrapolate from there, draw a curve from there and you extrapolate out to 2017, what we see is unless something changes, unless something changes by 2017 we will have 155 million acres of U.S. cropland that will be infested with glyphosate resistance. And that's a staggering number for me just to even think about. Again, the world's greatest herbicide, and unless something changes, 155 million acres of resistance.